our wonderful executive director is out sick tonight, so we're kind of like winging it a little bit. For instance, we can't seem to get the sound system going, so much apologies um, for, for that. Um, so tonight we're really excited to have an in-person Red Bench. We've been really virtual for the last few years. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors tonight, Solar Texo, Sisla Builders, Track Brewing, and Stowe Cider. So thank you for that, everybody. And um, writing about backcountry skiing and his involvement with skiing in general and um, I'm not going to go too far <laughs> but I'm going to pass it on to him and take it away. All right. Thanks um, guys. Thank you everybody. We're, we're going to try and speak loud enough without the aid of uh, a microphone here. Um, it's really an honor to be here with the OGs, the founders <laughs> of the Catamount Trail. Um, 40 years ago, this year, three guys recently out of college with a crazy idea to ski across the length of Vermont, pushed off from the Massachusetts border, headed for Quebec. Now normally this would be the beginning of a disaster story. <laughs> we would all know how it ends. It would be something like the 21 skiers who skied off the side of Killington this week. It would end with you know search and rescues and dogs and uh, being on the TV news that night. These crazy recent grads uh, squandering the value of their education by just going skiing where there really wasn't exactly a trail. Well, here we are 40 years later, these same guys, it's been a little more than a few years since they've been in college, are about to do it again. So they're gonna do a 40th anniversary, they're calling that the Ruby Crossing. Is Ruby what, Ruby is at the 40th anniversary? Um, the 40th crossing of Vermont, again, to recreate uh, the original inspiration and the original route of the trail. And it occurs to me, to all of us, that many people probably don't know the story about how this crazy squiggly line that weaves its way along uh, the length of the Green Mountains and the state and the places where there isn't necessarily, there, well, there hadn't been a trail, there is one now, um, how this came to be, what the vision was, I mean, I can tell you the reality of it today is this is a huge part of the culture and resource of our state. People come to Vermont to ski this trail that Ben and Paul and Steve, uh, who is not here with us tonight, thank you COVID, um, he had hoped to be with us, but that these guys started out just as a dream. Now people are coming from Montreal and Boston and New York just to ski parts of it. I skied part of it on Saturday. I was up on the Catamount Trail um, in Moscow and Nebraska Valley, and you can't get a parking spot there on a good powder day. It is extremely popular, um, and this is all a credit to something that happened four decades ago. So it's also a huge economic resource for this state, it's become a big driver, something that in the modern Catamount Trail Association, of which Matt Williams is the executive director today, and we have in this room, there is a, a bounty of executive directors of the Catamount Trail. There's Jim Fredericks, one of the early ones, so it's really fun. Steve Gladstone. Oh, Steve Gladstone. Is he, is he, oh, there he is, hidden by you. So, you know, at any moment, Matt, you could just go on vacation and let these guys uh, oh, no. take over. <laughs> so it has become many things, and that's what we're going to hear about. I'm going to give you just the, the bullet point uh, bio of our esteemed guests. So Paul Jarris, one of the three who started off, um, I was also, over the course of dinner, I was hearing about people who thought they were gonna join them, who couldn't quite make the grade. There were others. Um, 
They are, did not end up in the TV news, but they also didn't make it all the way across Vermont. So that's kind of cool, didn't know about them. A reporter for the free press, I guess, or whatever. <laughs> May he rest, uh, oh, he's resting comfortably now. So Paul was actually, um, after skiing across Vermont, this is, of course, the normal training for a family doctor in Vermont, which is what he went on to be. Uh, for 20 years, was a family doctor, both in Vermont and elsewhere. He was the commissioner of health. So for all of us who listened to Dr. Levine over these years of COVID, Paul was the Dr. Levine of his era in the 80s with Jim D under Governor Douglas. Um, then he ran a uh, national organization for state health commissioners and was the chief uh, medical officer for the March of Dimes. So, the, and he is recently retired, um, so he has lots of time to ski across the state again, and has three kids. Ben Rose um, was the very first executive director of the Catamount Trail Association after skiing across this thing and helping to give it the name, the Catamount Trail. He was also the executive director of the Green Mountain Club, and he is now the disaster and mitigation chief for the state of Vermont. So all of these floods we've been having, what is it like every other month, they so, all end up on his desk. Um, and Matt Williams has been the Catamount Trail Association Executive Director since 2018, coming here from North Carolina, where he was a coach uh, at um, Warren Wilson College. Warren Wilson College of biking and Nordic skiing. What it was. Not, not a lot of skiing down there, but yeah, that's like, <laughs> from, from Vermont, though. All right. Totally like so, with no further ado, I want to take us back to 1984. And if you haven't been on the Catamount Trail website, you got to see pictures of these guys and their get up then and their skis then. They were just telling me their gear then. No metal edges, no skins, no nothing. Well, you did have skis and you did have boots. Um, so maybe, Ben, I'll start with you to just give us the origin story of the Catamount Trail and what was the inspiration? As I understand it began with a cross-country bike ride with you and Steve Bush. Right. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Before I answer your question, I, there's something I've got to say, <clears throat> which is off script, which is that the people in this room are... You can stand uh, up so um, you forget. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me okay? Um, the people in this room are the history of the Catamount Trail Association, and a lot of people in this room, to the extent that there's any legacy here, it belongs to a lot of the people I'm seeing around this room. And I, I don't want to name names because I'll forget people, but you know, I'm going to name names John Broadhead and Gina Campoli, and Steve Gladstone and Jim Fredericks, and Neil Van Dyke and Poppy Gall and Jim Peace and and Paul Kendall and um, Lori Fisher, my wife, drew the first paw print. And um, I'm sorry if I haven't named you, but I just want to acknowledge that the Catamount Trail exists because of the people who have carried it forward. Uh, Sharon, and, and and so thank you for being here, Rick. It, 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 this is this is. I, I thought nobody would come, so it's just, you know, <laughs> Dave, Dave, like so many people have put so much into this idea to make it real, and so that has been one of the great affirmations for me of my life. So, going back to your question, can you hear me if I sit? Yeah. Um, sure. So, um, Steve, my family moved to Vermont when I was a teenager. My best friend in high school was Steve Bushy. Uh, uh, some Abnaki ancestry, uh, somebody who was always out in the woods, knew how to build fires, knew how to do things, always had an adventure that was too hairy for the Champlain Valley Union Outing Club. Yeah. And so he'd get me and Tom to do it with him. You know? And Steve was always a geographic schemer, and he taught me about the outdoors. And we had out adventures together. We took a bike trip across the country together in the summer of 81, I guess. And that in the summer of 82, Paul came in from Alaska where I think he was doing a residency, if I've got this right, and the three of us spent the night camping on um, White Rocks Mountain on, on the Worcester Range. It was raining, we were in the tent, Paul was jet lagged, we drank a lot of wine, and 
I think Steve had, Paul had passed out, and Steve and I were talking about what was our next big adventure. Because the real world was encroaching on us, and, and we, we were thinking about, okay, we biked, but what, what's going to be next? Maybe it's something closer to home. And I remember the moment when Steve said, and I think he, it was sort of drunkenly slurred, let's ski from Massachusetts to Quebec. <laughs> and we did one of these corny high five things. <laughs> I'm in. I, and I said, I'll do it. I'll do it. Let's do it. And we'll tell Paul in the morning. <laughs> and and that, was, that was the moment when we decided we were going to do it. But Steve, it's a pity Steve isn't here to tell a story because he really has the most authoritative story about this. He was getting a master's degree in geography and he had written a book for Northern Cartographic about the ski touring centers of Vermont. And in the course of that research, it clicked in his brain that it wasn't just a ski trip, that the touring centers could be connected and that there were in fact backcountry skiers up and down the state who knew the secret connections between the different touring centers. And if we could just get those people to ski with us, we could connect the dots. And so it wasn't originally conceived as a backcountry trail, it was conceived as a front country trail in Steve's mind, connecting those nodes of touring. And uh, he, he also tells the story that this came to him like a vision because he had a summer job roofing in Charlotte. And he was standing on a roof in Charlotte and peers out across the Green Mountain Ridge and says, why can't there be a trail like the Long Trail for skiing and that's because for anybody who has skied the long trail, much of it is really terrible to ski. Uh, not the least of which is that it's perfectly groomed for hiking, which means with five feet of snow on it, you are skiing through the canopy of those balsam firs, which are threatening to rip your eyes and hair out. Looking for white blazes. Good Looking luck. for yeah. white blazes. Isn't that nice? Yes. So back to... Okay, okay. so just, so, um, so then I went off chasing Lori on, on exotic travels. Steve did his master's in geography, actually pushed up the end-to-end -end ski trip, which was to be the proof of concept of his thesis. Um, from 1985 to 1984, um, I came home from Nepal to join him. You, you came back from your residency to join Steve um, in March of 1984. And in the month and a half preceding the ski trip, which started on February 28, 1984, um, Steve um, and I basically mounted a little expedition in our backyard and got sponsors um, who I can still rattle off, but um, Gordini, okay. You stole my props, David. Oh, um, sorry. I still have my mittens that Gordini lent us. I'll get them for the you. Ski no, rack, right here. The ski rack gave us these fancy suits. Um, Carmu gave us backcountry skis, which we never had before. And um, so, and most importantly, the touring centers, along the way um, recognized that we were trying to do something that was important and the uh, bed and breakfast along the way said, you want to stay here on a Tuesday night in March? Sure, you can have a night of free lodging. And so when Paul came in, uh, I remember saying, you know, here's, here's your stuff, here's your, your Gordini wear, here's your zoot suit from Ski Rack, here are your two pairs of cargo skis and the Solomon bindings, the stuff that people had donated to this crazy end-to-end -end ski trip, and we put together the first edition of the Catamatural News. Now, the, the story is that Steve went to a meeting of the Vermont Recreation Association in January of 1984, and announced the formation of the Trans-Vermont Nordic Ski Touring Association. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, but Steve and Paul, and this may have also involved alcohol, um, came up with the Catamount Trail as the, the name for this thing. And I believe the morning before Steve's press conference, it occurred to me that if the trans Vermont Nordic Ski Touring Association was gonna build a trail called the Catamount Trail, we should just call it the Catamount Trail Association. And so that's how it all came together. And then Steve went to a board meeting of the Green Mountain Club, that venerable nonprofit, um, and, and said, 
would you all like to take on this project? Because we think this could be a winter analog of the launch trail. And the old wise white beards of the Green Mountain Club said, oh, that's a wonderful idea. We wish you young whippersnappers luck. But we've got all that we can handle with the long trail and the high trails. Good luck. And so we took our typewriter that dates us and the bylaws of the Green Mountain Club and we basically just plagiarized and we formed a new nonprofit and populated it with um, people from the State Recreation Department and the vast snowmobile clubs and uh, anybody we could find who was interested. John Broadhead, Dave Brodigum, some of the ski touring center folks who recognized the potential and away we went with a nonprofit and we got a grant from the Vermont Travel Division to do the first edition of uh, what became the, the guidebook. And um, we just basically used the nonprofit model and the power of the idea brought in great people and it, here we are. So Paul, last we heard your name, you were passed out in a tent <laughs> in the Worcester Range and woke up to be voluntold that you would be joining a cross Vermont ski. What was your sense and reason for joining this? Uh, it didn't take any thought. It was just a matter of, yeah, let's do it. And pretty much that's the way most of our adventures came together. Someone comes up with an idea and we'll go, yeah, let's do it. And you didn't think about it, you just did it. And uh, because it sounded great. Um, and I think where the thought really came into this was, you know, we, we were winter campers and we spent time all over Quebec and Vermont and Maine. Um, and the first was like, well, maybe we should, you know, do it and winter camp along the way. And then it's like, no, that's, that's not viable. And, and that's where it really came is we got to take the existing trails. And as we ski through, you get the ski uh, pro there, show them where you want to go on the map and say, now guide us. And then stringing the ends to ends. And that way it becomes a trail anyone can access. They can access it at a, at a ski area. They can access it in the middle of the woods. So a beginner can ski it. A really experienced person can ski it. If you have no money, you drive out in your car, you ski the day, you go home, or you camp like some people do. And if you want to be some, you know, some rich New Yorker or somebody wants to come up here, um, with all respect to New Yorkers, I think. <laughs> you know, you can stay end to end at these exclusive Vermont ends. So we wanted to build something that was viable for everybody, and and therefore would last. So, you made an association the night before. Most of us, when we go skiing, we don't form an association and get nonprofit status <laughs> to go skiing. So, um, as I recall. You got like the, the thing from the Secretary of State the night before you started saying you were an organization. What was the point of that? What, what was your idea then? Um, I, I think it started in Steve's brain and, and I bought in that there was a trail to be had here and that Vermont should have a winter analog of the log trail and that the two could interconnect and create something bigger than the sum of the parts. and. Uh, we, I, I think we did foresee that this was going to be an organization that would be part of Vermont. I, I think it has part to do with the success because so often now you'll get a grant for a one-year planning period. And nobody has the energy to get through a one-year of planning, so we just did it. And then you learn from your mistakes along the way. Um, so I, I think that's part of the reason this is here. we just did it. There's something else, David, which is just the power of inertia. Um, once we put out that first newsletter and said, this is volume one, edition one, volume one of the Catamount Trail News. Uh, the second issue had a letter to the editor from Jim Cullough, McCullough of the Catamount Family Center in Williston saying, that logo is a sloth print, not a paw print. And, and so we drew the, the paw print logo of a proper catamount. And, and also, we, there was a membership form, and people started sending us money. And so off our porch in Burlington, we had to publish a second issue and a third issue, and um, then people would send us more money. And, so we, and then the board was formed, and, and the nonprofit model just sort of took off to build a trail. Yeah, because we kind of, we skied a concept, you know, it was orienteering. There were no markers, there was no trail. And, and really, it never would have succeeded. And we have board chairs here, like Paul there, 
over the years who brought the wisdom and the, and the knowledge that was far beyond anything we ever had. So if it didn't have an association, the skills between the volunteers, the executive directors, the, the leading board members never would have come to make this thing real. We couldn't have done it. So as you're doing, as you're skiing and coming to the various inns, what are people thinking? I mean, you know, besides like, well, these guys managed to scam themselves into a room for the inn for the night. <laughs> That's exactly what we were thinking. <laughs> Did they kind of picture some more noble venture than that? I think there were people who probably got there was something going on here, even if it was just that we were skiing end to end. Um, I don't know how many people really thought about what this could become. I, I don't think we could have. This was so, what it has become is so far beyond what we ever could have imagined. You know, there's what, 5,000 members now? Less than that, 2,500. 2,500, you know. I was into marketing. So 2,500 members, you know, 12,000 people use it a year. So, you know, we never would have guessed that. Um, and again, that's because there was an organization for all this brain power to come together. Yeah, the early years had a number of threshold moments when it became increasingly clear that this was actually going to survive and thrive. Um, Jim Painter, who was a, a dear friend, um, he was one of the early volunteers, and we'd just be licking and stuffing, you know, kind of our trail newsletters. And um, um, somebody sent us a thousand dollars. Wow, this this is real. We we got the blazes printed. I remember hammering up a blaze uh, at um, uh, Tucker Lodge on the German in German Flats. That's where the first blaze was hammered into a tree, and they taught us use two aluminum nails. That way the blaze will last longer as the tree grows. And, and you know, as the miles of blue blazes started to go up, and once we published that second edition map, each of those was a checkpoint when it became more real. <laughs> so because we're a room full of skiers, I know what everybody really wants to know is about your equipment. Now all you've done is tease us with one mitten. I think there was more to tell us what the vintage, oh, two mittens. What was... mittens, they're still my best okay, mittens. Okay, okay, they're not, you fulfilled your sponsorship obligation. <laughs> <laughs> think I think we did that for No, no, that's too much information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be white. <laughs> but I do want to get this in, David. Um, yeah. I, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, um, with someone's encouragement, I donated <clears throat> my original Carhu multi-grade skis and my red and white zoot suit, you know, the... The, the song. The Sant uh, uh, suit that, that the ski rack had done it to us um, to the Vermont Ski Museum. And there was a display up yeah, there, there with a mannequin talking about the Canada Trail. Yeah, and a lot better than you did. Too. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I believe that this museum has my red and white ski suit somewhere in the basement or the attic. And, if the ski museum can find it, I will stuff myself into it again. <laughs> Please don't find it. I, I don't think that's a challenge anybody is in a hurry to make real. But um, talk about some of the misadventures of skiing 300 miles across Vermont where there wasn't yet a trail. Well, even the first day we were down Messrs. Porter to Wilmington and we just sort of were skiing along and we got misplaced. So right off the bat we realized that we really have to follow the map of the compass because there's there's no trail here. So that was that first lesson of like wait a minute we're out in the woods all the time how could we not know where we are. The, the worst thing we came across um, should I mention Joe Mark, Joe's name? No I won't mention names. But we, we, so we would always ask the ski uh, pro to guide us and you'd show on the map where you wanted to go. Now some knew the area incredibly well and some didn't. And one gentleman took us out with telemarketing equipment and uh, which was his nickname, I won't say. But um, so he, he knows a shortcut, so he takes us on a shortcut. He also brought a whole bunch of kids along without hats and not proper clothing and stuff. And we're like, whoa, this is not. And then we get out there and he goes, I'm lost. I'm going back. <laughs> so he goes back. By now it's three in the afternoon. We have a long way to go. So 
so um, so we, we start navigating and I think two or three times that night we took a vote between the three of us, are we just gonna spend the night out here? And we weren't <coughs> equipped to spend the night. But um, Steve's an incredible, uh, with his map and compass, and he kind of figured out where we were, and then we hear this noise off in the distance, and it's a snowmobile. So we headed down to the snowmobile, and we met this, we got on a vast trail, met a snowmobiler, who gave us a couple of shots out of his flask, flask. <laughs> and, uh, and basically told us where to go. So we got in way after dark that night, but it was a, it was a pretty scary night, because it was down maybe in the teens, and you know we, we weren't set to stay out overnight. Now at this time, by the way, Bob Brant's coming along and a few other people who are Bob's a great ski patroller, so we're gonna have actually real stuff so if someone gets hurt we can handle it. I don't even know that we had a first aid kit then. But we were, you know, 20 years old with no frontal lobe. <laughs> 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 um, ben, does any uh, kind of adventure or misadventure stand out in your mind? Um, there are a few, but it's it's not how I want to spend this precious time. <laughs> Telling those stories. He doesn't um, want to embarrass himself. <laughs> it, it was a great trip. I mean, you know, I've obviously the couple. The other thing that was remarkable was the last night uh, we were skiing to the border, and there was supposed to be you know TV guys there that uh, Vermont Public Television did some recording, put out a show, uh, and they were supposed to meet us at the border. But it, we had this ice storm, and everything was frozen. So we ended up just skiing down the middle of the road to the border. Yeah. And the border, what's the border there? It's North Troy. And so it has a little like thing about as big as an outhouse with a guy in it. And he sees us skiing up there with these fancy outfits and he was totally confused. Like, who are you? Like Martians. He looked at us like we were Martians. So, yeah. so we, he took our picture and that was the end of the trail. The three of us up there doing that. But, but those um, multi-grays were great for skiing on the road. Yeah, the more salt and mud that got on them, the faster they went. <laughs> one, one important thing, though, is that the route we skied has evolved a lot. I mean, the, the route has moved more to public land, more to backcountry, off of snowmobile trails. There are less touring centers now, unfortunately, although some are still integral to the trail. Um, but um, also, the geographic selection had us going right up the railroad tracks from Jeffersonville and coming into Montgomery from the west through the Cold Hollows. And I think it was John Broadhead who said, look, you're in the wrong place. I mean, go to the snow belt, go to the upper Lamoille River Valley and, and come over to Crasper. And, and the, the second or third year when the trail moved over towards Crasper and then came into Hazen's Notch from the east instead of the west, that really made the northern part of the trail something worth skiing. Having said that, railroad tracks are pretty good to ski down. Yeah, and snowmobile trails. I mean, we would not have made it that first time without being able to just book miles on snowmobile trails. Well, let's connect the past with the present and bring Matt into this to talk about the trail today, much of which is conserved. I mean, it has been a project to take this crazy idea and turn it into something much more involved that involves land stewardship, conservation, um, and just where the trail should be located. So what would, when you were past the baton in 2018, what has it taken to preserve this trail? Um, yeah, I, I think yeah, it's worth saying to Ben's point initially that, you know, from that first ski, it took, I think, over 25 years to even get to a contiguous route, um, a contiguous trail that was mapped and signed and had landowner permissions in place. That was a, you know, two and a half decade long project in and of itself um, just to get there. And certainly just to maintain that we work with you know, the, the U.S. Forest Service, we work with the state of Vermont, we work with a dozen municipalities, I think 260 private landowners. So though three quarters of the trail is conserved, there's a tremendous amount of work just to maintain those relationships, to maintain that access, and you add the backcountry zones to the mix as well. Um, and and so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a constant um, work, you know, to, to steward that and that, um, but I think as we look forward, 
and what it takes to maintain a viable trail. It's sort of, it's about more than just having the trail in place mm -hmm. in the era of climate change, right? And so uh, a lot of our work over the last five to 10 years has been to upgrade and improve the corridor. So it's a lot more drainage work, it's culverts, it's bridges, it's location at higher elevations where that's possible. Um, in addition to conservation work to ensure that, you know, particularly in low elevation areas, um, in parts of southern Vermont that really it can be skiable on, on three to six inches of snow um, with the idea being that you know winters are a little more variable we have freeze thaw cycles but we want to make the most of the snow that we do get we want to make the season uh, as long as we can snow making is not an option so we improve the trail right and improve the trail corridor and in, in some areas that has led to co collaborations with mountain bike groups with hiking groups um, and that's you know another way that we can increase the viability of the corridor, right? Is to to um, facilitate year-round access where it's appropriate. In many places it's not, but in some places it is. And uh, um, you know all the all the values that make it a great winter trail, connecting communities, crossing these unique landscapes. Right? Many of those <laughs> hold true in the summer too. And, and so um, you know a lot of our a lot of our work now is, is geared towards how can we how can we make this a viable um, and excellent skiing resource for as long as we possibly can and how can we take the values that are really embedded in the in the organization and in the trail um, around building and connecting communities around providing access to really special mountain landscapes and and make sure that those continue to be a part of the outdoor recreation landscape in Vermont, regardless of what winter looks like. And I'm really glad you mentioned the landowners, because again, this would be nowhere without the landowners. And we have a, you know, sort of a permissive policy environment, but this is a tremendous <coughs> generosity when someone lets a trail go across their property. And without that, we'd have nothing. So. If, if I can anticipate your next question, David, uh, and, and follow the, the thread of climate change and what it means and what is the future of the Catamount Trail, I mean, at, we were talking about this at dinner, and we were talking that you were going to say, now for, now for, um, what was it? I, I accused you of being a climate denier, and I said we'd leave time for you to talk about that. Which, <laughs> of course, I'm not. And, but the point is that the climate projections for Vermont and for the Catamount Trail are dire, and, um, we may not have conifers, much less enough snow to ski in, in several decades. That said, and not denying anything, I would not bet against this trail. And I believe in my heart that the Catamount Trail Association is going to um, use the 40th anniversary, the Ruby Run, uh, as a launch pad to the campaign to get ready for our 50th anniversary. I'd like to come back and ski it for the 50th, assuming we survive this one. Um, and the, the focus of our 50th anniversary as an organization should be to think about how we're going to make it to 100. Just like the Green Mountain Club did, great party for Vermont, you know. Um, I don't think we should bet against the trail. We have a, a, a narrow way. A, a sticky wicket ahead of us over the next few decades until decarbonization gets figured out and carbon removal and or until a big volcano goes off and gives us global winter for a year or two whatever I just wouldn't bet against something happening that allows the catamount trail to survive it may be that it's a special event when we get enough snow to ski the whole thing you know, it's not going to be, we asked the National Weather Service this time for the best weather window that would give us the highest odds of having continuous snow cover. And what we got from my emergency management friends at the National Weather Service was that if we left in early to mid-February, we had a 52% chance of having continuous snow cover. Wow. All right? And that's going to go down over the coming decades. But eventually there's... We are going to figure this out. Don't bet against human ingenuity. And, and the Catamount Trail Association should be honored to be a canary in the coal mine and refuse to die. All right. Thank you for that. Um, very inspiring.
the uh, man you mentioned about this trail is more than a trail. It connects communities. And I think you had a flicker of that idea, Ben and Paul, when you started out and formed that nonprofit, that you knew there was something bigger here. Um, maybe, Matt, I, I, I'm curious if you could talk about some of the efforts to bring in people to skiing on the trail who haven't had access to these opportunities before. Talk about part of the work of the Catamount Trail Association now in reaching out into the communities. Yeah, well thanks, I appreciate it. I think it's, it's really, um, it's been really important to us to think about sort of what, what makes the trail powerful, right? I mean, it's ultimately it's just a, a corridor through the woods. If we stop maintaining it, it would disappear in a couple of years. Um, and really, the, the power of the trail is its ability to serve as a platform for a community for building relationships, for connecting to the landscape, and it's, it's the way people use it um, and the experiences that it, it helps provide that, that bring power to it. And, and so our goal as an organization is really to take, to the extent we can, a holistic approach to, okay, what does that, what does that mean? Because world-class trails are part of the mix, but in a context like Vermont with a lot of private landowners, long-term protection is really important. Um, and it also means taking a really active role in, in expanding access and getting more people out there to use it. I think you know, just because it's free um, doesn't mean that everybody can just get out and, and use it. And so over 10 years ago, we started running youth programs um, with a few local schools in the Burlington area. Um, these days we work with over 1,500 youth across Vermont in nine counties. Um, and so on a typical year, 75 to 80% of those kids have never been on skis before they ski with us. We're really focused on underserved communities, whether those are um, uh, in, like, poor uh, underserved rural communities, whether that's um, you know, New American students or um, you know, for traditionally underrepresented groups. Um, you know, we have programs in, um, all over the state now. And so we're really focused on long-term engagement with students. We run you know, programs over the course of the winter. We typically work with students for three years at least. And, and really it's about connection to the winter landscape, building community, um, giving kids the opportunity to run community ski programs where um, you know, we just we show up with skis, we partner with Craftsbury and other organizations to just show up and, and welcome people out. And we have volunteers there to help get them set up with equipment and go try it out. We run, we run tours that are free. It's, um, it's important to us to sort of say, we want, we want to build the next generation of skiers and we want to bring people into this, into this sport. I mean, I, I know for me and most, most people in the organization, we can all sort of point to the way that skiing has influenced our lives. We can point to the friendships that we have. I think these three guys are, you know, a, a prime example of that, um, and the way it's enriched our lives. And so I think, you know, trying to play a role in sharing that is is uh, a really special thing to get to do, and um, something I'm, I'm certainly grateful to get to be a part of. And I think it's been a uh, increasingly important part of our work as an organization um, you know, to sort of foster a ski community in a, in a more holistic sense. And this, the program, the, the Ski Cubs? Yeah. Where it's, it's really getting kids out who've never had an opportunity before. And, you know, it's not just a matter of diversifying skiing. There's a lot of, you know, skiing is a, a very white sport, uh, plus Nordic skiing. And so bringing these kids from the North End, bringing these kids from Barry, wherever they are, different racial, ethnic groups, certainly different socioeconomic groups to get out there is really important. And then the rest is up to us. We need to make them welcome when they're out there. So if we meet them on the trail or something, just encourage these kids, welcome them, make them feel like they're joining a bigger community. Because if they get out there and feel like, hey, I'm the only one who looks like me around here, they're not gonna come out again. So um, that, of course, if donating equipment <laughs> to the program or, um, helping, you know, there's, there's plenty of volunteer opportunities uh, for people that had a ski. And uh, I, I did one way back early on for the formal program, and it is fun to get these kids out there and see somebody who can't stand up going to 
make it a dozen strides by the end of the day or something. So really encourage you to take a look at it. It's a great service opportunity for all of us. Um, you're now about to do it all again. You, when you last did this, you were in your 20s. Now you're all uh, either retired, uh, recently retired, or imminently retired. Um, so I guess, uh, Ben, why are you doing it again? What's moving you to hit the trail again? Oh, so many things. Um, I w it would never occur to me not to take the opportunity. Again, I was keying on the 50th anniversary. Um, We're still walking on our walk around skis for <laughs> but, uh, but the 40th is, is obviously happening. Um, uh, over the course of the, I stumbled into a growth industry with disasters, you yes. know, natural disasters. <laughs> so over the last few several bad things that have happened, COVID and the July flooding, I've built up just a ridiculous amount of paid leave, and I'm going to burn it on this trip. With <laughs> <laughs> um, that, and um, um, it's just going to be fun. I'm really excited. About it. Paul, you were talking about some of uh, the training you've been doing, which uh, didn't end well recently. So share what it's like to train yeah, for I, this uh, now versus sure then. I, yeah, came out on the, one of the Catamount sponsored tours. And we did a um, camel's hump down through uh, down to the Bonuski, and then we did uh, Bolton Trap, which used to be a ski we would just go out on our skinny tees and do for fun. And last year, I think I self-actualized. I had no ego left by the end of that. <laughs> we were skiing on oatmeal. My skis were digging. I was spending all my time on my rear. And so I'm like, I got a lot of work to do. <laughs> you know, with 40 years, your balance is different. Your muscles are different. And, and I was still on these skis that weren't like now. I mean, the, out, the, out, the backcountry skis now are way beyond what our downhill skis used to be. So um, I spent the last year working on balance, working on strength, and I got a pair of roller skis, which I have to say, make sure your life insurance is up. <laughs> so I, I learned every possible way to kill yourself on roller skis. So the first day out there, I'm skiing along, and all of a sudden I get whipped backwards and land on my head. I didn't realize that the cracks in the asphalt could grab your pole and pull you back. So I duct taped my poles all up so they couldn't go in the cracks. But I don't know, there's a million things that go wrong. But anyway, I did bust about three ribs one at one time. Um, so a friend of mine who horseback rides told me about the vest that horseback riders wear. So I got one of those. What's the so vest? It's, it's just padded vest. They actually make them out of Kevlar, but I don't want to spend that much money. And it's to protect your ribs and your spine if you fall off a horse. So I, I had a helmet, uh, mouth guard, uh, elbow guard, knee guard, horseback riding vest. <laughs> Are we going to see you in the NFL playoffs this week? Yeah, right. I, I was skiing this summer thinking, it's going to be 100 degrees colder when I do this next winter. Paul lives in Virginia now. You yeah. should so, add that in. David, but, one thing to note is that when in 1984, we were 20 somethings and it took us three weeks, sort of like hiking a log trail takes roughly three weeks. <laughs> this time we've allotted five weeks. We're all 60 somethings, core group now. And um, it's not just allowing for shorter days, it's allowing for weather days and rest days. And I, I am honestly hopeful that we'll be able to double up the legs on some days so that we build, give ourselves more rest days or maybe a day to sneak back to the email or something. Okay. Um, and before we turn this over to your questions, I want to ask um, Paul and Ben, what is most meaningful to you about the legacy of this original crossing? It has a life. You know, so, so far as we ever expected, it has a life of its own. It's volunteers, the, the donors, the landowners, the, you know, the, the staff. It's, it's, it's like we were the obstetricians that delivered this thing to the world. <laughs> and, and other people have raised it and are taking it on. And it's just, I mean, it must be what you feel like as a grandparent. I keep telling my kids, forget the marriage thing, just give me babies. <laughs> <laughs> it's just incredible to see how where it's going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I say that, first of all, it 
I feel like it has added something to Vermont. It, it, it does feel like something that has enhanced Vermont being Vermont, and it's connected us to the Vermont landscape in a way that people have been connecting to the landscape for 8,000 years on, on little boards on their feet. It's a great way to get from A to B in the winter. It's poetic, it's, it's human, real, humans realizing their potential. It's, 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 a, it's a positive thing. And for me personally, it has made me an optimist for life to see my friend's good idea turned into a real thing in the world by the power of cooperation and the nonprofit model and using the brains and wisdom of other people. It's, it's, it's proven to me that humans can actually do big things working together and it's made me hopeful. So um, I hope we'll keep it going. All right. Well, let's turn it over to uh, any questions or comments in the room here. Yes. What were your favorite and least favorite sections <laughs> of the trail while you were skiing? I used to love Bolton Trap for last year. <laughs> <laughs> I will love it again this year, I'm convinced. But I, I think just, you know, I kind of think of it specific areas, but some of the, just the beautiful skiing through the wilderness with the pines around you and the snow and the no dropping off the trees. I mean, this could be describing anything, but getting into that mindset and that mode where you're just there, and, and you know, skiing is it's almost meditational the way it's so rhythmic. So that getting in that zone is so wonderful. And so for me, uh, I'll say um, the natural turnpike in South Lincoln is very beautiful, and up through Craftsbury, going up into Hazen's Notch is yeah. very beautiful, and seeing Jay Peak. Um, um, and then on the other side, when we skied uh, through from um, Camel's Hump to Bolt, we arrived on Garner Lane's doorstep at, at Bolton Mountain, just half dead. And he gave us beef stew that he had made and resuscitated us, but it was about five below zero when we went up to Bolton. And then the next day we went across Bolton to Traps and it was well below zero all day. And we arrived at Traps frozen and had a nice place to stay there. That night it snowed 18 inches. And when we woke up, there was too much snow to ski down Ranch Camp. I mean, we just were trudging because there was too much snow. And so we decided to take an enforced rest day. We came back and the snowmobiles had busted out Smuggler's Notch. We went over through Smuggler's Notch and then it was 56 degrees. And <laughs> there were pictures of Steve in, in shirtless skiing through the corn stubble towards Jeffersonville, walking through downtown Jeffersonville with 56 degrees on the bank thermometer. And to get to where we needed to end that day, we had to just hightail it up about an inch of slush on the railroad tracks to Bakersfield. And we just felt like we were running out of snow. It was late March. We might not make the border. That was a low point. Mm -hmm. And Steve's promised he won't ski, ski shirtless on this track. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, what kind of, are you guys going to ski on the same type of skis the whole way? Or are you going to you're going to switch it up? No, significantly upgrade. <laughs> yeah, but will you like if you're going over like bolt to traps? Oh, will you get on. Will you? I'm going to bring two pairs: one one light touring oh. pair and one uh, backcountry pair. Yeah. yeah. Jim, I I have never owned a pair of metal edge skis until. Uh, the pair that Matt helped me buy, which arrived and got mounted today. <laughs> I haven't even tried them out yet. I'm going to bring them along just so I don't die on those four or five days. But mostly I'm still planning to ski on the same, um, you know, skinny, skinny skis I've been skiing on for the last 20 years. And most days the Catamount Trail is fine on light touring equipment. Most of it at least, I think. <laughs> The sense of wonder is alive and well, and that's um, inspirational, always, as is being out there, right? Um, whether with little kids or by yourself or with your best buddies. Um, I'm wondering, since I'm wondering who would like to talk a little bit about um, our, your, the Catamount Trail Association's relationship with land stewardship, sustainability of ecosystem as more and more of us have found love for this place and this recreation and pressure going forward too because there are a lot of us and there's limited landscape. So it's a hard question, but here it is. <laughs> yeah, it's you, Matt. 
getting paid for this. Must be good. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a really important question. It's it's certainly been a very active one in Vermont, and um, you know, I, I think it's it's absolutely true. There's there's no such thing as um, being out in the woods without having an impact, right? And everything we do um, adds up, and and there's a lot of stresses on the landscape, and I, I think. We have tried to do a lot of work um, to just say, let's give ourselves the tools to make um, decisions that are as informed as possible. I think it, it's our attitude as an organization that um, people getting out into the woods is a good thing, right? And, and connecting with the landscape is a good thing and connecting with each other through outdoor recreation is a good thing. And so um, I think it's, it's an unqualified, um, you know, win that in the last few years, more people have discovered that, right? It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing for the world, and I think we're better off for it. Um, but you're absolutely right that it leads to pressures on the landscape. And um, so we, we've done a lot of work in the policy space around that. We actually just this last spring <coughs> released something that we call the Vermont Backcountry Ski Handbook, which we developed in partnership with the state of Vermont and with the U.S. Forest Service. Um, and it's, it's, focused on the development of backcountry ski zones, so places like Brandon Gap or Braintree Forest or Willoughby State Forest where we've developed through chapters and with partners these backcountry ski zones. Um, but a lot of it is focused on looking at the impacts of winter recreation, looking at the impacts of backcountry skiing, and, and trying to say where is this appropriate and where is it not, and how do we make that determination, and how do we as skiers understand what's going on and how do land managers and landowners understand what it is that we really are looking for because we're not trying to build ski areas, right? It's something, it's something very different. And so, um, you know, our goal is not to have, you know, backcountry skiing everywhere all the time. Um, and, but we do want to support people getting out there and, and using it. And, um, you know, there's not a, so there's not a blanket answer. There's, it's, it's very, obviously very, place specific and community specific, um, but I think there are impacts that we have to take seriously and, and what we've tried to do is to give, give ourselves as an organization and as a community and land managers a, a sort of common set of tools um, so that when these questions come up we can, can have a framework for, for navigating them and trying to find a balance because that's, that's ultimately um, <coughs> what it is, um, and, and there's hopefully space for, for a lot of it. different types of recreation, different ty types of land use, right? These conversations come up with hunters, they come up with, with foresters and loggers. There's, um, there's a lot of, of different groups, um, and, and wildlife and ecosystems need, need space too. So um, I think the, the 30 by 30 conversations in the legislature right now are, will be an important part of the mix as well, and just looking at this sometimes these questions get asked on a very small scale, parcel scale basis, and that's a really hard place sometimes to have these conversations that are ultimately landscape scale, right? If you're talking about wildlife connectivity, um, if, if you're talking about habitat connectivity, if you're talking about forest blocks, 50 acres is not the scale to have that conversation effectively, um, but that's sometimes where it ends up, and it leads to some really hard, contentious conversations, um, and so I, I think it will be really helpful um, and I'm, I'm optimistic about the framework within the 30 by 30 bill to really bring people together. There's, there's a lot of um, intentional conversations that that bill is facilitating to say, you know, let's look at the state on a landscape scale basis and let's look at what are the, what are the most important ecological blocks. Let's identify some of those. What are the most important wildlife corridors? Let's identify some of those. Where are places where, you know, other types of use, recreation, housing, development, those sorts of things are at least, you know, less impactful. And at least to have that framework at scale, I think will will be another helpful bit of context for these conversations moving forward. And then hopefully we as, as an organization and other rec organizations can sort of do our part to, um, you know, sort of play our role in, um, in helping to find that out. If people aren't out in the woods, they're not gonna gain a love for it. Oh, and we, yeah, we need that love to preserve and if they're not under their own power nordic skiing what are they doing to get out there so i'm with you yeah yeah, yeah I, I was going to say something similar which is that and i want to be aware of vermont exceptionalism 
you know, I, I mean, Steve, when he was conceiving this trail in Ottawa, he was thinking about the Jackrabbit Johansson Trail. And I mean, there are other places in the world that have great long Nordic skiing opportunities. It's not just Vermont. But that said, um, you know, having kids out in the world now, there is something about growing up in Vermont. These kids, there's an opportunity in Vermont to have a child who is connected to nature in a way that's very hard to do in a lot of places now. And you know, having cross-country skiing as part of your childhood is a, a special opportunity in Vermont. Yes. And, and that's how you make environmentalists, is you, you have people who experience I'm, the environment. I'm one of those. <laughs> uh, Rick, you had your hand. Uh, as a way of pumping up your trail maintenance, and if it wouldn't screw up your image too badly, have you thought of partnering up with the mountain biking community? They've got an awful lot of horsepower. They can, they, they can ride much of the terrain that the trail goes on. They've got a lot of organizational stuff. And I'm just thinking of creative ways to maybe get a lift. Yeah, I, did you, it's like you read our newsletter. Uh, we've, yes, we've, we've entered the, the new century. Um, but yeah, no, um, we, we have it, and we have some very active partnerships there. And, um, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and so when, you know, it's, it's interesting, and we've been exploring year round use for a number of years now. And we, um, as part of this, all this, this 40th work, we were going back through a lot of archival um, photos and footage, and there's this there's a PBS documentary. Um, Vermont PBS did a, a piece on the, the 84 ski, and there's Steve Bushy, you know, talking about how you know next summer he wants to go bike this thing and prove that it can be a you know year-round recreational resource for, for Vermont, and um, very much a, a you know everything that's that's uh, old is new again moment. But you know, as we as we look at the types of work that we need to do to make the trail more climate resilient, right, and skiable in low snow conditions, it starts to look a whole lot like a mountain bike trail <laughs> when it comes right down to it. Um, and so, you know, that, um, amongst other things, sort of drove some of these conversations and, and we have an active partnership with a group called um, the Bellamont, which is looking to do for mountain bikes what the Long Trail did for hikers and the Catamount Trail did for skiers. Um, and other mountain bike groups to say where it's appropriate. In many places it's not. There's a lot of landowners who are happy to see winter use, who have no interest in summer use, and that is, we absolutely respect that. And, um, um, and there's a lot of places that the Cavanaugh Trail goes that you know, are frankly not appropriate for a summer trail of any kind. Um, they just go through landscapes that, that wouldn't support sustainable non-winter use. But there's a lot of places where it will work quite well, and the, the more we can collaborate, um, focus impacts on a single corridor rather than having all of, you know, everybody having their own trail, um, we can focus dollars, volunteer hours, stewardship resources, all of those things. Um, I think it's a win for everybody, and so particularly in southern Vermont, we have, we have a lot of partnerships going on. We're looking at co-locating 30 or 40 miles of trail from the Massachusetts border north with, with mountain bikers and, and hikers down there. And so, yeah, no, it's, it's been exciting. Well, early on, uh, we formed a partnership with VAST, and you know, we're all trying to get all the Catamount members to buy memberships in VAST and vice versa, and, and that's a harder leap than mountain biking is. But, you know, we all want, wanted to be out there, and they had trails, and we wanted to be on good terms with them. I think there's less overlap with VAST now than there was in the beginning, but a little better, yeah. Um, Neil, you had a question? I'd like to hear a little bit about your thoughts about overnight crew use of the trail. You said originally the um, kind of concept of winter camping was just a little overwhelming. You ended up saying that you crashed down a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, very Wouldn't you? Lately, there's been a movement towards uh, some middle ground of uh, kind of a hot dog concept. <coughs> Catamount Trail and Grand Camp and um, others uh, will lodge along the trail. What are your thoughts about looking to the future as the concept of kind of this European concept of uh, a uh, system along the trail? 
Yeah, well, that would be wonderful. I mean, and, and, uh, either if you want to tent it, tent it. And last year, somebody, it was last year, we tented that. Um, it seems like about, yeah, almost once a year, we get somebody these days who's, who's eased end to end, often straight through and, and camps out. Um, but yeah, I think the, the reality is that, that huts um, and places to stay along the way that, that have you know, a wood stove or, or some way to stay warm definitely make overnight experiences way more accessible for people. Right, and, um, and it's a great thing. And um, I mean, I think what, what you're describing is very much the mission of the Belmont. And, and so, um, you know, Vermont's about partnerships, right? It's about, it's about community and it's about collaboration. And, and so that's been a, you know, great opportunity for us to, um, you know, bring our, you know, uh, connections and, and, you know, in many cases, our trail resources and, and trail permissions and things like that um, to that effort um, so that, you know, we can um, sort of add add to the momentum and, and help help facilitate that and then it benefits skiers, you know, and, and we can get that experience for skiers along the trail and in a lot of places, so. It, yeah, there's a lot of different opportunities along the trail. I, I, this summer, Lori and I, I came with Misha and, and I watched his face drop when he realized that we have stayed in inns and not out in the snow along the way. It actually was not that hard. And um, it, it's kind of cushy actually the way we did it. And I think that there's a sweet spot where we can provide opportunities for people to be out overnight on the trail, which are affordable. And you know, that exists in Europe and in other places in the world. And it'd be wonderful if the Catamount Trail can, can host people who can who can do a, a multi-day tour affordably and ecologically? I, I think that's in the future. But so there's also an opportunity to spend thirty thousand dollars and stay in a fancy place with you know delicious food every night. I mean, it's, well, I, I will just add. I'm a board member of the Ron Hutz Association. You can already do this. There are huts along the Catamount Trail on Camel's Hump uh, at Bolton Valley. Um, at Stratton Pond, there's a, a year-round Green Mountain Club shelter. There actually are a lot of opportunities and we're exploring, you know, building more huts as well. And I'm sure I'm forgetting some, even as I'm saying this. So for people who really want to do that and not carry a backpack and, and winter gear, there's already ways to do um, hut to hut skiing on the Catamount Trail. Yeah, we just, uh, that first year, we just thought it would just really narrow down the appeal of the trail. I saw you have a question. Uh, yeah, I wondered if, uh, so you mentioned, or Katie mentioned that you relied a lot on local guides, and I was curious how you found those people, if you saw them ahead of time, or if you just kind of found them as you went along? Yeah. And second part of the question, were you mapping your route as you went, and do you still have that route? Well, so Steve had visited all the Nordic, all the cross-country ski areas, and when we asked him to guide us, it was, I mean, basically, we go over it on the map. Here's where we want to go. Here's where we want you to lead us. So, and again, some of them, you know, knew, knew it really well, and some couldn't even follow the directions we gave them. But that, that was a real exception. Just to be clear, Steve Bushy is the cartographic brains of the operation. And you should say what Steve does now yeah. for his job. Right. He yes. runs Map Adventures. It's a, they make the best maps New England. Yeah, uh, Steve is an incredible uh, map maker, and his wife is a uh, graphic designer, computer graphic designer, and so she's added dimensions to his maps, you know, through artistic work. So go into any of the shops along here, um, and you'll see the Nordic cartographic maps. They're they're just beautiful. Yeah. Why don't we take one more question? Right here. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to go back to. The I was talking about that earlier about how the trail got built. Um, I was involved back in the 80s with uh, Jack Handy and Dave Bobby and Tyler and Randy and, um, in the Campus Home Learning Center. Uh, I mean, I think you you must have hit a bell with Jack somehow. You you uh, because I was I remember reading I was in the local paper, you know, just inviting people to go out. Trail crew and cut the Catamount Trail, 
and I think we must have cut the steam late in the Catamount Trail on the second time. Because Jeff kept changing his mind about <laughs> where he wanted to go, and he was working in the state. You know, back then he didn't get arrested if he cut a tree in the woods, but you know, he did have to get permission. And um, I just think he was he was the headmaster at Stowe School, and he was a very well liked person. Yeah, thank you for invoking Jack Candy. He, he was both inspired by it and inspiring. Um, and I should say, you know, coming back to the original theme of all the people who've made it possible, um, this this trip coming up, I mean, the first five nights, we're staying with Alan Bennett down in Wilmington, who's a super trail chief. I mean, he's one of these people who has put so many hours into the Catamount Trail. And he's staying at the Stearns place, you know, uh, uh, Jay Stearns, the, the uh, chairman of the board, is the son of John Stearns, who was a very important chairman of the Catamount Trail Board. And, and, and uh, we're going to be staying with people who have put hundreds and hundreds of hours into the trail along the way, um, yeah. and skiing with trail chiefs, so that there are people who know every inch of this trail like the back of their hand. Dave Brodigan was the first board chair, too. He, he signed our certificate for doing the first uh, <laughs> so for people who are interested and now uh, uh, inspired, you can go to catamounttrail.org and you can see there is a daily schedule of their upcoming end-to-end -end ski and you can join them for a day. There is also going to be a banquet at the Trap Family Lodge on March 3rd, I think. March 3rd, that yeah. will also be, uh, that's also on the website. You can get tickets and, and celebrate four decades of the Catamount Trail. So let's continue to make this a community celebration of all that these guys started. And it's an opportunity to say thank you to you guys for what you <laughs>